Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. We're just going to give everyone a few minutes to join. And while we're doing that, meet Matt Winger, our speaker. And then we've also got Allie Bain on. She's going to be helping me with just monitoring the chat and the questions. We'll give everyone just a few minutes to join. Maybe drop a note in the chat where you're joining from. Oh, wow. Yeah, we've got, wow, all over. We've got folks from Pennsylvania, Missouri, New Mexico, Iowa, Fort Lauderdale, Scottsdale. Welcome, you guys. Wow. Michelle oh. Mays, Dr. Michelle Mays. That's that's there pretty cool. Eddie Caparucci. Well, that's a, good to see you. Um, Someone's joining on vacation. That's dedication right there. Wow, that's that's a high bar to compete with. <laughs> vacation. Welcome, you guys. All right, we're at two minutes after. So welcome everyone. We're, we've got a, a lot of people from a lot of different places joining today. Oh, Charleston, South Carolina. I love one of my favorite cities. Um, all right, I'm going to get us started. My name is Tara Young. I'm the Senior Director of Marketing for Integrative Life Network. Let me share my screen here. Just so you guys know, this is being recorded and we will post the recording on our YouTube channel next week. Um, you should be able to enable the captions on your side. Um, if you can't, I'm so sorry. I don't know if that's something we would be able to figure out live on here. Um, make sure that you put your questions for Matt in the Q&A, um, not in the chat. Um, if you put them in the chat, Allie and I will just redirect you to put that in the Q&A. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, that would be great. And we will spend about 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the webinar answering questions. So with that, let me share my screen here really quick. All right, just so you know that you're in the right place. This webinar is called Attachment Trauma and Sex Addiction, and your speaker today is Matt Winger, who's the Clinical Director of Begin Again Institute. As a reminder, this webinar is brought to you by Integrative Life Network. ILN is the premier family of trauma-focused treatment centers for substance use, mental health disorders, eating disorders, and intimacy disorders. And just so you know, um, I think a lot of people do get confused, but ILN is a parent company for three different brands here. So uh, we have Integrative Life Center, which is in Nashville, Tennessee, which is where I'm located. It's where Allie is located. Um, and then we have Begin Again Institute in Berthet, Colorado. And then we have Sauna at Stowe, which is in beautiful Stowe, Vermont. And Matt, like I mentioned before, joins us from Begin Again Institute. So he's the clinical director of this program out of Birth in Colorado. And I just wanna tell you a little bit about that before we get started. So uh, Begin Again Institute provides 14 day residential intensives for men uh, 25 years and older who are struggling with some pretty specific stuff. So sexual addiction, hypersexuality, compulsive behaviors, and intimacy disorders. So BAI uses uh, something that you'll learn about a little bit more in this presentation, which is the TINSA model, which stands for trauma-induced sexual addiction. And it's a neurobiological approach to treating the root cause of addiction. So it's really um, stellar program that they're running out there. And not only that, the intensive includes a partner support program for betrayed partners of those sex addicts at no additional cost. So something that we know for sure about addiction, particularly sex addiction, is that on the other side of that relationship is someone who's been betrayed and dealing with the fallout of that and the betrayal trauma. So we make sure to include them um, in some relational healing while the guys are with us. So you can learn more about Begin Again Institute at beginaginstitute.com. 
And just as a note, uh, we do have an intensive starting next Saturday, March 30th through April 13th. Um, they're two week intensives, like I said. And if you do have a referral for that, um, you can reach out to admissions at beginagaininstitute.com. Just a few last things before we get started, just a reminder for your CEs today, um, for your attendance to be registered, uh, make sure that you join the unique join link in the registration confirmation email. So um, if you're like with a friend and you're both joined from the same screen, only one of you is gonna get credit for the attendance. So uh, uh, you must remain on the webinar the whole time. So this is a little big brother of us, but we can see when you join and when you leave. So make sure you stay on the whole time. Uh, you must complete the CE evaluation, which will appear on the end page after this webinar concludes. Okay, that's very important. So before you close out uh, of your browser, make sure that you click on that link, take the survey. Only those who take the survey get a certificate. So that's very important. If you forget to do that for some reason, we'll also link it in the follow-up email. Um, make sure you complete those by end of day on Monday, March 25th. And then we'll make sure to send your certificate no later than Wednesday, March 27th. Like I mentioned, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available to view on Begin Again Institute's YouTube channel. Um, however, CEs are not available for viewing that pre-recorded webinar. And finally, this is a question everybody asks. Yes, you will get the slides from this webinar. We will send them with your certificates once we send those out next week. Okay, if you have any questions, you can reach me and Allie at marketing at integrativelifenetwork.com. And now let's learn a little bit about your speaker today. Uh, this is Matt Winger. Matt holds a master's degree in couples and family counseling from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He began his clinical work with traumatized children and young people and learned how complex issues can lead to mental distress and dysfunction in homes. He connected with the TINSA, trauma-induced sexual addiction, approach to treatment, particularly the overlap between childhood trauma and addiction, and started working with those who identified as sex addicts at Begin Again Institute. As a counselor, a certified clinical partner specialist, and clinical director, Matt is energized by helping clients find words to express their emotions around their traumas. He utilizes uh, EFT, attachment theory, motivational interviewing and guided meditation and is trained in brain spotting. Matt sees all people as deserving of living a full, healthy life and works hard to help his clients move toward that end. So with that, I am gonna shut up <laughs> and stop sharing my screen. And Matt, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, um, thanks Tara. I'm happy to be here with you guys. Um, this presentation uh, is a little bit, it's longer than the allotted time that we have. So I'm going to kind of skip over some parts of what I might normally say, you know, about me and my story or whatever, and we're just going to jump in. Um, and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end um, for questions. So let me share my screen and pull up my slides here. All right, can everybody see that? I mean, I don't know if there's a way for you to tell me. But... Okay. There we go, Matt, we can see it now. All right, so we're gonna talk about attachment wounding today and how that affects um, treatment for sex addiction. And, but my, my main goal here for, and I find this, is, to be helpful for clinicians, uh, people that are leaders in the field or coaches, even um, clients. In fact, we give this presentation in, in, in a different form to all of our clients that come through Begin Again Institute. So I found that this information can be helpful for, for addicts in recovery, for partners, for clinicians, for coaches, just as a way or a, a framework to approach the really complex narratives that we often um, encounter in this work. Um, addicts present with a lot of data points and they don't really know how to um, 
coalesce those into some, in a narrative that we can approach clinically and um, create progress around. And so this framework that we're going to talk about today is really just a way to generalize or, or frame a complex issue in a way that is concise and approachable for clinicians, coaches, clients, and, and, and everybody in between, right? So we want to get out of the the pattern of uh, approaching these these complex narratives and and, pl and playing guessing games and and we're spending so much time solving the Rubik's cube of what's going on for this particular person using you know SDIs and and, and so forth and uh, for our and it became necessary for us in our program to try to figure out a way to frame this so we can make quicker progress with our clients in that two week frame. And out of that came this approach, and it, it, it seems to be helpful. So that's kind of where we're going today. So I want, you know, I want to equip us with a just a frame, and it's going to be overly simplified, okay? But that's on purpose, so that, so we can approach something and make progress quickly, and then get more granular as we get to get to know the client or or, or further the work. Um, but but I. Uh, I, I don't want to be caught either by a client who's on purpose trying to confuse me because they don't really want to make progress and they're still attached to their addiction or, or get lost in the weeds and, and then not be able to make that traction that we really need to make early on with clients in order to help them stick in, in the healing process and therapy. So, all right. So these are the kind of three things that we're going to cover. You know, how does, how does attachment wounds really kind of, play here with addiction? Um, how, how does it play out in relationships? How does this, how do these interact with each other and, and, and betrayal? And there's a really interesting uh, link between these things here. And then what are we, using that simple simplified frame, what are some really good interventions that can help us make progress quickly? Okay. All right, so the bedrock here that we're kind of speaking uh, uh, to this issue from is the TINSA approach, which is trauma-induced sexual addiction. And, and this approach, which is I feel like is kind of common knowledge at this point, it maybe wasn't as common knowledge maybe 10 or 15 years ago when it, when it came out, but I feel like it's, you know, kind of just what everybody uh, feels about uh, trauma and addiction these days. But... Sexual addiction arises to regulate an unregulated nervous system. Okay, that's what this uh, approach postulates. Okay, that, that that there's this dysregulation in the nervous system caused by trauma, not attended to well by the caregiver, right? To co-regulate with that young person, right? We can talk about co-regulation, right? And everybody kind of knows that that idea, that model of you know, the original co-regulator was, you know, mom in the womb as the baby is um, comforted and warm and provided for in the womb and regulated by that, that heartbeat of the, of the mother, right? This, the, the, we're taught from the womb to, to regulate off of another nervous system and, and children do that. So if they have this dysregulation around a trauma that has invaded their life and they are not sufficiently, um, uh, cared for and, and regulated with a caregiver, this is going to set the nervous system in, in, in kind of a journey to try to figure out what can I do to regulate. It's going to set the young person up to be, um, uh, to seek out addictive behaviors. Okay. Um, now, sometimes the traumas that are inflicted by the caregiver and that, creates its own set of dynamics, right? Or it is a, a trauma that happens outside the home and it's not attentively addressed by the caregiver. And either one of those can develop an attachment wound. And what I found really interesting in, in this work, and you know, I have a weird kind of uh, experience with this work. I, I've, see, I've been working in this program since 2019. And in that period, well over a thousand men have been through our program. So I have this kind of like um, survey of, of kind of a, you know, a swath of, of men that are at high acuity, um, you know, in their addiction. 
And what I found in, in speaking with them is that even if the trauma is not perpetrated by the caregiver, the ineffective response of the parent is oftentimes more damaging than the, the trauma itself. It's hard to believe, but uh, I hear that over and over again. You know, my parents, you know, I, you know, I spoke to this one guy, he, he, he and his sister were kidnapped and sexually abused and driven around in a van and for hours. And, and when they're, um, when the police finally found them on this, on just left on the side of the road, their parents came to pick them up. They piled them in the car and just drove off and they never mentioned it ever again. Right. And he said that that, um, you know, almost denial of the, the wound that happened by the parents and their ineffective response to ask them about it, to get them help, to get them uh, extra attention. Um, you know, their strategy was, we're just not going to talk about it. And hopefully those kids will forget about what happened to them. Right. And his response was anger because I thought about that every day and my parents never met me there to help me. Right. So that would, that ended up for him being more traumatic than, um, what the the trauma itself so either way this attachment wound forms either by the caregiver perpetrating the trauma or an ineffective response to it outside the home and what i mean by attachment wound, there's a lot of different kind of uh definitions for this but we're just going to take it really simply here like it's just a damage to the bond a damage to the emotional connection between the child and the caregiver like i said this leaves the child Without that bond or that damage bond, uh, the, the child or the young person has to regulate their nervous system on their own without support. And they're, and they're going to have to find some kind of outside in coping because um, they don't have the resources to do that. And that's, that's leaving them primed to explore addictive behavior. So when I say attachment, when that's all I mean, right, it's just a damage or a break in the bond between the child and the caregiver. Now, now what effect does that have on the nervous system? What effect does that have on their core beliefs what effect does that have on their relationships as adults and and how do we approach that that's really what we're talking about so again this is an overgeneralization it's on purpose right but attachment wounds generally fall into one of these two categories right a, a invasion or abuse or vacancy and you know neglect right the 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 parent is in, is invading the experience of the young person with abusive behavior or they're not responsive to their needs, right? There's a emotional vacancy or dismissal or neglect of that young person's needs, right? Now, we we're talking about sex addiction today. So how does sex addiction form from these traumas, this traumatic attachment wounding, which is in itself its own, own trauma, right? Well, this is kind of the idea here. So sex addiction can form, not all the time, but can form from the unmet needs present at the time of the wounding, okay? So there's a need present for that child or young person. They're reaching out to get that need met. They're either met with abuse or they're minimized, ignored, invalidated, you know, met with that vacancy, right? And that, but that need doesn't go away. So I have to find some way to get that need met or get, you know, a corner of it met or just a little bit of it met or a diet version of it met. And, um, you know, that's going to show up in addiction, right? And I'll be more specific about that in a second. So we're going to talk about these two kind of environments. Like we said, it, like invasion or vacancy. And the way that I make this kind of simple for, for clients is, you know, we talk about um, these environments in which these things occur, okay? Um, and that first environment in which um, these kind of attachment wounds occur is what I call the hot box. And, and what I mean by hot box is the emotional temperature of the environment is high. Okay, there's chaos, there's abuse, there's a, uh, you know, you know uh, escalation in the emotional temperature of that environment. And this can include physical, emotional, psychological, verbal, even sexual abuse, you know, instead of that secure, attentive, attuned um, attachment. Now, 
uh, the, the child or young person is going to naturally expect love and safety and connection and affirmation and all these, these are all attachment needs, right? They, we come out and I heard somebody say this one time, and I'm not going to give them credit because I can't remember who said it, but we, we come out looking for someone who's looking for us. Right? We're born looking for someone who's looking for us. And we intuitive, intuitively believe that this, this big person is going to care for me. They're supposed to care for me. And parents are love their kids, right? And so I must be loved, or I think. And so I have this kind of uh, natural uh, desire to reach out to this big person for, you know, to reach out to them for connection and support. And kids are going to do this again and again and again and again and again. You know, like I said, I, I approach this field from, from coming from dealing with trauma uh, in children and young people. So I used to see, you know, kids as young as six, all the way up to teenagers. And what was interesting about the littles is that, you know, they were coming to see me because they, they had encountered the state in some form or fashion, right? There was abuse, drug addiction, something like that going on in the home. And so their home environment was not great. And we would come, they come to my office, we talk about their feelings, we, we color, we find some colors to talk about their feelings. And, you know, little Susie, she'd feel heard and she'd feel seen and she would, get, you know, gain a little bit of a tool or a resource to help her with what's going on in her world. And she would, you know, leave my office, you know, bye, Mr. Matt, you know, see you later. And her mom or dad, you know, and I remember this specific instance, the mom is at the, at the end of the hallway. And she turns and she says, hey, mommy. And she's, you know, going to run to mom. And that, wouldn't that be great, right? If mom could just say, oh, how was it? Did you have a great, you know, have a good time? Do you feel, you feel good? Like, let's go, let's go get some ice cream or something like that. But the response is to her, to her literally running to mom, mommy, you know, with her arms out, m mom says, you know, hurry up, get your things. Did you leave your coat in his office come on we gotta go we're late blah, blah, blah. right and she's just barking at her and frowning at her and you know raising her voice and that and it's that moment right of of reaching out again and how many times had that young girl reached out to mom and hoping that mom was gonna run down the hallway to her and say Susie I missed you how was it right and wrap her up right but she's gonna reach out again and again and again and again because that's how we're hardwired. But around age 9, 10, 11 years old, something shifts. Okay? And at that age, the brain develops to a point where it can um, discern complex patterns, right? And that desire to continually reach out again and again and again. And maybe this time mom is going to respond to me. Maybe this time dad is going to respond to me. Um eventually they put it together that this caregiver is not safe or reliable or consistent and they're going to cease to reach out in the same way and attempt to care for themselves okay and that so that outward facing arrow towards the caregiver becomes a backwards facing arrow okay i guess i have to care for myself and that sentence there i guess i have to care for myself i have I've done a kind of an informal poll, right, of, of, you know, I ask guys in our program, you know, how many men have either said this to themselves, you know, sex addicts that are seeking treatment, have either said this to themselves or, or said it out loud, I guess I have to care. And every group, every time, 100% of the hands have gone in the air, I think, you know, to the best of my memory. I guess I have to care for myself. I guess I'm on my own. So now I have to either, I have all this emotion and all these needs, and that's either going to become internalized in depression or anxiety or externalized into, you know, deviant behavior or troublemaking, fights, you know, burning the school down, getting to know the assistant principal by his first name, you know, that kind of thing. Right, I got to learn how to self-soothe 
and self regulate I got to do it on my own. Now, this is the beginning of addiction. What I mean by that is if I have a need to figure out how to care for myself and then I get exposed to some maladaptive sexual behavior. And what I mean by maladaptive means it's too much too soon, right? It's either harmful or I'm not prepared for it. It overwhelms my system, right? It's not It's not at the right time and it's not in the right way. It's not in the appropriate mode, right? Sexual abuse, molestation, rape, uh, early exposure to pornography. If I get this maladaptive sexual experience and that kind of pairs up in that time frame with my need to care for myself and I, okay that 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 felt different that felt interesting or exciting or weird or scary but but it but it made me feel different and i didn't like feeling the sad or the overwhelmed or the anxious or the scared and maybe i didn't like it maybe i did like it but it made me feel different and i might go back to that the next time i get um, overwhelmed or sad or scared or lonely. And then I might do that again and again and again, right? And then over time, something that becomes a habit becomes more um, escalated and, and moves towards compulsivity and, and, and it might turn into an addiction, right? Now, what gets really confusing for, for people that have experienced this is when the phrase, I love you, gets put over this hot box environment, okay? Now, a lot of guys they, that I've worked with, and and, and in this space, I, I work with men, so that's why I say men or guys when I say this, but this can be true of uh, female sex addicts as well, and, and other types of addiction, I've found. Um, you know, these, these, these abusive parents or these unsafe parents don't often say, I love you, but there's this implicit idea that the child is loved. I'm a, I am, my parents love me. They're supposed to love me, right? So they're working out that assumption. Or in these abusive homes, like it gets kind of slid underneath the door. Hey, you know, your mom can't talk to me like that. And I'm sorry you had to see that, but you know, I love you, right? And the kid's like, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, I know that you love me. So this this creates this profoundly confusing environment where where I I'm being told or I have the idea that I'm being loved and I'm being treated this way. Well, how do I make sense of that? Because it's very confusing, right? And the way that kids make sense of this confusing narrative is that I'm going to tell myself a story about that. Kids do this. I'm going to tell myself a simple story that's going to help me make sense of a confusing environment in which I am being told or understand that I am loved, or an intellectual understanding that I am loved, or I'm told that I am loved, but I'm being treated in this harmful way. Well, some of these simple stories sound like this. May, I'm bad. Well, that actually makes this make perfect sense. They love me, but I'm bad. And that's why I get treated like this. Or maybe I deserve bad things because I'm, I, I do bad things. Or, or maybe there's just something wrong with me. Or, or maybe I'm just not good enough. Or I'm not meeting the standard. Or I'm a failure or I'm stupid. Right? And this is a, these are these uh, phrases that we hear in our clients as adults. But these stories and these, these simple cognitions that turn into these little stories, that, that, that's from when they were little and it's still following them into adulthood, okay? And they're, they're gonna try to um, reinterpret their adult life through this frame, right? Well, I'm an addict, so I'm bad. I'm an addict, I deserve bad things. I'm an addict and I just can't stop acting out. There, there's something wrong with me. I'm broken or I'm, I'm just not good enough. I can't meet the standard. And, and I must be some kind of idiot because I keep doing these things over and over again and I can't stop. And what's wrong with me, right? Um, my screen just went black. I don't know what happened there. Hold on. Let me try again. I don't know. 
know what's happening to my slides. Matt, I have your slides if you need me to pull them up at all. Um, you'll just have to make a note when I need to progress them. Oh, can everyone see them, but I can't? Is that what it's No, happening? No, we're, we're seeing a black screen as well. Okay, that's really weird. Um, give me one second. Sorry, maybe we can address something in the chat or something while I try to do this. <laughs> Sure thing. Let me come off a of video here. Thanks everyone for your patience. I'm just reloading it. I think hopefully that'll get us to where we want to go the power of of the internet has failed us okay let's try it now okay can you there all see that? yeah okay i'm going to repin you All right. Who knows what happened there? Uh oh, it's black again. Okay. All right. All right. So, like I said, these are simple stories or mantra or mantras or what I call old tapes that just play on repeat in the mind over and over again. They follow them into adulthood. They affect the way that this person is going to see the world. Affect the world that uh, or affect the way they see themselves and, and see the world, right? The world is dangerous or love is dangerous or I reach out and people hurt me, right? And that's just kind of the the pattern that I get in stuck into, right? And these beliefs are self-confirming, okay? Because I have this negative belief that I'm bad or I'm not good enough or whatever. And out of that shame, you know, and... I act out or, you know, triggered to act out and, and that reinforces my negative self narrative. And, and these arrows actually function in both directions. So they're all just kind of, it, you know, it can work in any direction here. I start by acting out and then I am shame that confirms my self narrative or I start with shame and go, right. It's just this little uh, hamster wheel that just gains, you know, power over time. Um, these self confirming set of beliefs. Now, what is what is um, actually more common, and, and if you worked in the field, you you you, you understand this. But it's like eighty twenty of the people that show up in treatment actually experience the cold box rather than the hot box. So we assume that sexual addiction is 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 a kind of a uh, you know, a serious issue, it probably came from a, what we call big T traumas, right? Like abuse, sexual abuse, you know, physical abuse, those kinds of, um, you know, exposure to violence, those kinds of things. But more often, we see this in, in our, at least in our treatment facility, we see the, this cold box environment um, being the more common one, right? And, and in this version of this this environment the child again naturally expects love and safety and connection and affirmation and validation and all these attachment needs but in response there's this literal or emotional abandonment right and sometimes this is like they they get this cold box experience because dad just is just gone or mom just leaves right mom mom goes to you know, to Arizona to find herself, you know, heard that one more than once, you know, no uh, shade to anybody from Arizona. Right. But, you know, there's this literal or, or emotional abandonment where that, where the caregiver has their emotional back turned to the young person. And there's this emotionally dismissive, this minimization or this overall distraction from the needs of the young person they're not attuning to them they're not tuning in their focus is over here okay their emotional gaze is somewhere else 
right? And the and and I ask clients like, what is in this scary cloud over here that's that's taking up all this caregiver's attention? Well, it can be almost anything. It can be their mental health. It can be the mental health issues of uh, another of a sibling, right? Or or an illness or finances, right? Or their romantic relationships or their marriage issues or maybe the caregiver's addiction issues or maybe there's a special needs sibling in the home that's really getting all of the focus and and and, and the young person feels like they can't even complain about it because you know charlie really needs that extra attention so i can't complain and put my hand up and talk about my needs i have to be a good kid here in this system because mom and dad are clearly overwhelmed by what's going on with charlie so my job is to not have needs so that they can focus on him because he really needs it and what a good heart from that child, but they're not getting what they need, right? Or maybe there's a squeaky wheel sibling that's taking up a lot of the emotional space. Right? Again, it's going to work the same way as in the hot box. The child's going to continually reach out and again and again for that connection or, or support, but eventually they're going to realize that this caregiver is not safe or reliable, and they're going to cease to reach out, and that outward-facing arrow is going to be that backwards-facing arrow, and the phrase is going to be the same. I guess I have to care for myself. I guess I'm kind of on my own because mom and dad are clearly you know, overwhelmed or distracted by this thing over here. Now, what happens when we put I love you over that? Now, here's where guys tend to get really confused because in these cold box environments, they're not actively being harmed per se. Right. There's no big red flashing lights. And so they come in with this this other narrative where we're like, well, I was basically raised in a, in a good home. You know, we went on vacations. You know, dad was he provided for us. He, he went to some of my games. You know, I don't know. I mean, it seemed like the classic American experience. I don't know why I'm an addict, but we and I was to, maybe I was told I was loved. Right. And I had some concept of that. But when we look at it a little bit closer, we see this pattern here where mom and dad are kind of like looking over their shoulder and saying, that, yeah, great job. I love you. And then they're distracted again. Or maybe we'll get all A's and then dad will turn around and say, hey, great job on your report card. And and like, OK, well, I, I guess I have to get good grades. I have to succeed. I guess I have to be captain of the football team. And they'll kind of turn around and acknowledge me and write it. So I, I developed this, this frame that, okay, I can get their attention if I am very successful in this thing or that thing, or I can get their attention if I'm really, really bad, right? And that's how they'll turn around and give me what it is that I need. And again, you're going to make up these simple stories around this, right? I, I, I'm worthless. I'm not important. No one really cares about how I feel. My emotions don't really matter. I, I guess I'm just not enough, or maybe I have to be perfect, right? But the, the, if the bedrock belief of the hot box is I'm bad and there's something wrong with me, I think the bedrock belief of the cold box is I don't matter. I don't matter. And if I'm going to get my knees bent, I'm going to have to do it, do it myself. And these guys will show up in group and they'll be really quiet because they don't want to take up too much of the time and you know, they don't want to monopolize, monopolize this, the time. And, you know, I didn't, you know, yeah, I'm kind of feeling this, but, you know, you know, I don't really know what's wrong with me. I had, a, I mean, this guy over here had this horrible thing happen to him. And, you know, I was never molested by a neighbor. And I, so I, you know, I don't know why, I don't, why I'm here. And again, self-confirming, self-perpetuating belief that you know I don't matter my needs don't matter and all that feels like my needs don't matter to my spouse and so I'm going to have to take care of it on my own and I'll see I'm, I'm, there's something wrong with me I'm not good enough I can't be perfect I act it out again and then just just spins around and around now what's interesting about the hot and the cold box is they they you know they're over generalized okay on purpose to help us get a frame for understanding that childhood experience but it's not just a blueprint of uh, what happened to me as a young person it actually becomes a, a mold I think or or what Sue Johnson calls kind of a working model for how 
relationships uh, go moving forward. I reach out and people hurt me. I reach out and people uh, deny me or dismiss me or invalidate me or ignore me. Right. These, this is how I just this is just how relationships work. Right. This is how attachment relationships work. This is how relationships in general work. And and so this is the this is my mold. This is how I understand. This is the temperature of the water that I'm used to swimming in. OK, so I'm going to either seek out relationships as an adult that fit that mold or I'm going to impress that mold down onto the relationship, even if it doesn't fit at first, to reform that relationship into a replica of the original dysfunctional relationship. Because that's what I know. That's what I'm used to. Subconsciously, I want to heal and repair that. So I'm going to seek it out to try to get a second swing at it. Now, if there's different opinions about that, but but I think that, that you know more than one can be true, right? That that okay, I'm uh, I'm gonna seek out this kind of relationship because that's what I'm used to, or this is what I feel like I deserve is is a painful relationship that you know that's kind of a idea that's that's based in shame, or um, I'm going to recreate the the traumatic environment so that I can try to overcome it. I think multiple you know perspectives on that can be true at the same time right and again this is subconscious like nobody's seeking out a relationship like give me another swing in my relationship with dad you know, let me get another swing in my relationship with my mom and i'm going to do it right this time but um you know i think subconsciously there's a lot of evidence there in our field to 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 give some credence to that thought right so this is where i would normally slow down and say what um you know, what, what box here are you identifying with client A, client B, you know, um, wh what are you resonating with? And they're going to, they're going to, you know, a lot of times they say this one or that one, or, or I feel like maybe I got a little bit of both, right? I got this hot box dad and a cold box mom or vice versa. And, and, and dad is really chaotic and dangerous. And mom is kind of uh, wilting in the presence of that danger and is trying to care for herself. So she's not present to the needs of the child because she's trying to survive in that environment too, or those roles can be reversed, right? So some people feel like they've got some m mostly cold box or mostly hot box or some version of both. And then some people actually describe, well, I feel like I kind of got both in the same person, right? I got some hot box. Sometimes they would abuse me and overwhelm me with this, or, or sometimes they, they would just be completely absent and I can't reach them. And I think that's more of a complex trauma, more of a personality disordered person rather than, uh, and, and I would tell a client then that, that that's a, that's a hot box, right? Because not knowing what your caregiver is going to do or how they're going to respond to you is a type of psychological and emotional abuse, right? There's this inconsistency in their emotional presentation that keeps me on edge. Okay, that's not hot and cold. That's just an abusive environment. Okay. And I'm not going to get into these other parts just for the sake of time here, but 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 this kind of explains to some of our clients why they emotionally regress when they're triggered because they're still kind of stuck in that box. And so they're going to respond the way that a, a child might might do uh, or a child might respond. And I think there's a lot of credence within that. I, you know, to, to parts work, you know, uh, uh, an exile, you know, coming up um, that, that never got attended to. Again, these, the, remember, we're going to get to this, but the, but the, these, these molds and this way of thinking, right. And this way of understanding my experience, it, it serves to maintain the addiction in a way. And we'll get to that. Okay. So how does attachment wounding impact relationships that are affected by addiction? And we're going to move through this pretty quickly. And this is where, unfortunately, this is where most people have questions when I give this um, presentation. But um, I'm, I feel like we're already running a little short on time. So we're going to move through this a little quickly. Again, you'll have access to these slides. So the way that I talk about this with guys, okay, like you're hot in your coal box. How did, how did that show up? In your life, how did it form? How is it still present for you in your relationships? Well, 
the way that we can illustrate this is by, you know, this timeline. Okay. So over here, you're born, right? Congratulations. You, you made it. And, and, and then there's this trauma that invades your world. And around that same time, there's this attachment wounding as you try to get that need met you know, around that trauma and, and it goes unmet. And, and, and I'm ex and again, around that same time or near that time, there's this maladaptive um, sexual experience. And that maybe that maladaptive sexual experience is the trauma, right? That, that's creating this need that's unmet in the uh, attachment wounding, right? And so uh, I got this exposure to this maladaptive uh, sexual experience. And I'm going to kind of, you know, go back to that and leverage that to make me feel different, than the, than the negative emotions or what I'm calling negative emotions that I don't like. And I can feel overwhelming to me. I don't have the resources to deal with as a child or a young person. Right. So out of that, this addiction is, is beginning to form, right. And it starts out as just mild compulsivity and then it moves into an escalation period around this time. You know, normally this is like mid to late teens where, you know, maybe I'm on pace with my peers or I feel like I'm on pace with my peers. We're exchanging media or, you know, pictures or talking about sex and sexuality or making jokes about it. And I kind of feel like we're kind of on the same pace. Right. But as I get later in that development, I'm starting to realize that this is a maybe a bigger deal for me than than other kids. And this, you know, masturbating to the point of self-injury or spending hours and hours and hours of time on these things and obsessions and fixations. And well, I, I'm going to stop talking about this with my peers and the behavior is going to start to go underground a little bit because I'm developing shame around it. Or maybe I've kind of always had some shame around it and it's just, it's, it's, it's getting bigger and bigger. But as I move into early adulthood, then there's this shift. I encounter this other person and um, you know, what people don't understand about sex addiction is is you that don't work in our field they they assume that sex addiction means that i want to have sex with as many people as i can you know anything that moves and you know i'm, I'm i want to have sex with it right and and it and why would i get into a partnered relationship if that's my goal right but we understand that sex addiction is not actually about sex it's about you know this wounded relationship and these unmet needs that have become sexualized and so i I, I actually have an attachment need and a drive to partner with someone to try to get my needs met again or try to, to heal, right? So sex addicts very often seek out monogamous relationships or marriages, right? And so early in adulthood, I'm going to seek this out. Um, and, and I may have some misunderstandings about this, like that, that, oh, I just have a really high libido or I have just a lot of sexual need or, you know, if I just had a outlet maybe i could a sexual outlet maybe i could could manage this right it feels it's trying to feel a little bit out of my control like if i just had some consistent outlet maybe I, I could be be fine and and this person is so nice and they're so beautiful and they're so attentive and they're so warm and they're so handsome right and and i'm gonna um maybe maybe they can save me maybe they can heal me maybe they can fix this for me and maybe for the first time, I'm going to try to put, modify my, my behavior. Like, oh, they wouldn't like that if they found out about that. I'm certainly not going to tell them because they would leave me if they really knew me, right? Which is the fear of most sex addicts at the root, right? If you really knew me, you would reject me, right? So I'm going to start to maybe try behavior modification for the first time. But as I'm in that period, there's becomes a shift. There's a shift here where... Um, the it turns from a relationship into an attachment. And sometimes this happens by revolution, right? All in one moment where I'm like, oh, wow, this relationship has shifted for me. Or it can evolve over time. We go from a relationship to an attachment. And all that means in, is that I'm going to start looking to this relationship to get my needs met. Whereas before we were just hanging out, having fun, Maybe we're sleeping together, maybe we're not. Maybe we're living together, maybe we're not. Um, but there's some moment or some evolution there where the relationship shifts from uh, just a relationship to an attachment where I'm going to turn to this person to get my needs met. And 
guys are sometimes able to identify those moments. Like I was uh, texting women on the way to my honeymoon. I was flirting with other women at my wedding, right? There's these emblematic moments that where there's some shift internally for them, where the intimacy becomes uh, too much beyond their um, ability to tolerate that kind of closeness or these hot and cold box attachment woundings start in, in, in the goggles that I have from those experiences start to shift the way that I'm interpreting the relationship. Like, oh, well, she really um, overreacted to that. Uh, oh, she's got kind of a temper there. Or he, you know, didn't really respond to me in that moment in the way that I needed to. I felt kind of abandoned there. And all oh, look, here we go again. This is just like this or that, right? And then those attachment molds arise. They arrive as that relationship shifts into an attachment. And I begin to look at it through those lenses. And what, but so, so why is this so scary? Well, because what happened then the last time I was in an attachment relationship, it didn't go great. And I had to care for myself. So that system is, is back online and, 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 it, and addiction begins to escalate a little bit after this point, right? And we'll pick up the timeline a little bit here, but in a partnered relationship, what is the partner thinking at this point? Well, they, they're sensing a shift in the relationship. They're not aware of the acting out behavior. So there's some confusion. There's a little question mark there. There's a little, mm, what's going on? And maybe they'll even check in and be like, you know, what's going on here? You know, we used to be so close and I feel like there's some distance opening up between us. Are we okay? Are you okay? And what addicts often do is, you know, they'll gaslight at this point or try to obscure, like, you know, yeah, everything's fine. You know, you know, work is just really crazy right now and I'm just really overwhelmed. You know what, you know, yeah, let's go on a trip. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah, we should, but you know, nothing to see here, you know, but but the partner can normally feel that shift or the absence of that emotional connection, right? They're not sure what to make of it. But this addiction continues to escalate. And then we get to discovery one, okay? And this is, again, overgeneralization here. But I often ask clients, where do you think your partner was at at the first discovery? Like, well, they were angry and, you know, they didn't like it and it really disrupted. And Yeah, and there was some hurt and there's some anger there. But usually the primary emotion around that first discovery is just sad how could you do this to me you know we made plans we made promises to each other you know i i can't compete with those images online or those those people you know i've had children my body's changed or i've gotten older my you know you know how could you do this to me right and they're they're sad they're feeling left and abandoned and inadequate right and hurt well, I, I'm still stuck in that hot box, cold box, right? And, I, and I, I'm looking to this person to get my needs met. And a sad person isn't very good at getting my needs met. I'm not, I never was taught or shown how to move towards a sad person and comfort and care for them. That never happened to me, right? So I've got to figure out how to care for myself. And, you know, I'm the one that did the bad thing. So how am I supposed to be the one who's going to comfort, right? So I... I I'm going to pull away from that sadness and, and they're just going to have to kind of figure it out on their own because I can't intervene. Right. I don't No one, they, they don't have the idea that I can be the wounder and someone that is trying to seek to comfort. Like they, they don't have that toolbox. Right. So I'm going to pull away and I'm going to have to take care of myself. And a sad person isn't very good at meeting my needs. So the addiction continues to escalate and then discovery too. Now, where's the partner at this point? Well, this is usually where like, oh, yeah, they're pissed. They're really mad. This is the four letter words. This is the escalate. This is the yelling. This is the big blow up. Right. And, and, you know, you mother, you told me that you were done and you told me you were going to get help. And you told me that we were going to get counseling and that you were going to stop. And you told me it was a one time thing. And now I'm filing out all this other information and you're a liar. And I hate you. Get out. I can't even look at you. Really high volume, right? Lots of stuff. Right? Well, guess what? An angry person isn't 
any better at meeting my needs than a sad person, right? And that's a little bit more scary. And so I might get activated around my trauma and be like, I'm going to rise to the occasion. Oh, yeah, F me? Well, F you. You know, you you never forgave me for the last time. And you've been holding me in contempt. And you've been resenting me. And you've been, right? And, and you, we don't have sex. And we don't have this kind of sex that I don't want to have. Right? And this is your fault. And you treat me. And you walk around with all this contempt. And that's why I act out. Right? And maybe the partner buys that. And maybe they don't, right? But I'm down, I'm not going to move into accountability. I don't know how to do that. I'm not going to move into responsibility. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to sit with that anger. That anger is dangerous because that means you're either going to abandon me or you're going to hurt me, right? Based on that hot box, cold box. So again, I'm going to pull away. And now I'm now now we're moving into this, right? Where the mold is almost all the way down. Now, what happens at Discovery 3? Well, they were already really mad. They were already really on edge. And maybe they allowed themselves to hope a little bit that things were going to be different between Discovery 1 and Discovery 3. But now they're feeling all of the things. Right? They're confused about what's happened to them. They're angry about the way that they've been hurt. They're sad about what they're grieving the loss of what they thought they had. They're they're crushed. They're, they're hard as a million pieces on the floor. And they're starting to feel a little... Uh, crazy, right? This is where that PTSD, that betrayal trauma is coming into full, full bore, right? And they're going through the phone, they're going through the emails, they're going through bank statements, right? And, and they're doing this detective work, not to catch him in the lie, but to try to establish their reality and establish safety, to establish some sort of norm that they can work from and be safe from, right? And guess what? The addict has now cultivated a person who is either so numbed out and done, which a lot of partners stay at this point, like, I'm just done. I'm just done. That they can interpret that person as dismissive. Or they've cultivated a person in their addiction that is so hard and angry that they can uh, call that person abusive. Right? And now the mold is down all the way, and I'm back in the relationship that I think that I um and it ought to be in right it reminds me of my childhood experience right where the ad gets to cast themselves in the role of the victim and they get to cast their partner in the role of the dismissive person or the abusive person right i look here we go again i reach out and they dismiss me right they're not they're just done they don't want to be in relationship with me then i'm trying i'm trying i'm trying and they just they turn their back on me and they won't meet my needs, right? Or uh, I've been trying to overcome this addiction and, you know, it's they're so angry and they're, they're so reactive and they, they've got a temper and I'm reinterpreting history because most of the time they weren't like that before all of the betrayal. Now, partners bring their own wounding to the party, but what we say is that addiction sets it on fire. Right. And maybe they had some personal issues that they needed to work on that were going unaddressed. But the addiction just goes. <sighs> right. But but the addict says, well, look, I just got a bad partner here. Right. I got a I've got a relationship problem, not an addiction problem. And if I was with somebody else, I wouldn't be doing this because I have to keep myself safe from this really dangerous person. Right. And maybe I should be with my affair partner. Right. They seem to really get me or whatever. Right. But what's what's wrong with this? Well, the reality is the roles have actually switched. And the addict is claiming the, the role of the victim when they are perpetrating trauma into the life of the other person, right? Their addiction has either made them dismissive and distracted. They're so obsessed with it. They're so focused on it that their emotional back is turned to their partner or they're so wound up in their addiction that they become emotionally, psychologically abusive in the gaslighting and the controlling behaviors and the manipulating behaviors, and maybe even physically intimidating, right? Punching holes in the wall or whatever. They become uh, abusive. Now, now, when I slow down here with guys and I say, what do you think it's like for a partner to be told that they are the problem when they are the one being uh, traumatized or abused. That's a special kind of, you know, uh, a, a psychological torture there, 
right? And of course, they're they're struggling. And of course, they're grasping. Of course, they're in the place that it wouldn't make sense. Their betrayal trauma symptoms, their responses, and their reactivity is a normal response to the way in which they have been treated. Now you're now I don't addicts are not Machiavellian, right? They're not cultivating this person and breaking them down step by step and in, 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 in you know crumbling them into rubble just for the fun of it, right? They're 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 reliving and re-experiencing these traumatic woundings. Um, this is what they're they're used to, right? And this but and it keeps the backwards facing arrow alive. As long as this person is not meeting my needs and I can interpret them as not meeting my needs, I have to take care of my own needs, okay? And these unmet needs that arose during the wounding are still present and they're distorting the perception of the addict. They're convincing the addict that their partner is, um, you know, the, 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 that their partner is the problem. Right, and that they're the victim when really that they're the perpetrator. And th this hot box, cold box mold that's getting pressed down, it maintains the addict's identity and it maintains their addiction. It maintains their identity as a victim and it maintains that backwards facing arrow. Right, in this way, an addict, a sex addict needs a relationship in order for this to, to happen. That's why they partner up. They need a relationship to need and they need a relationship to reject to kind of relive that hot and cold box experience and so now they now now through that distorted lens they can see the relationship conflicts as the problem not the addiction right i act out because of this conflict right and so the relationship conflict becomes the primary trigger for acting out both because it's distressing to them and it reminds them of their original trauma and then now they but now they get to blame the relationship problem and it becomes a justification for acting out. Well, if she just treated me different or he just treated me different, then I wouldn't do these things. But through through, through, through self-sabotage here and the addiction, we're going to arrive at this homeostasis of, 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 of where I grew up and what I was used to. And here's the kicker here. Be because if things were fine and I was continuing to act out in this patently absurd way, right? Oh, I'm sad, I'm gonna go see a, a hooker, right? Or I'm lonely, so I'm gonna go do this, right? These, these, and I use absurd in the in the concrete meaning of the word. It, it doesn't, doesn't line up, right? If my wife uh, is, quote, disrespecting me, that, that it's absurd to think that going to a strip club is, is a response to that, is a natural response to that, right? But, but addiction, you know, creates logic in the midst of the absurd, right? But if there wasn't this kind of relationship uh, conflict, then I would have to look at the behavior straight on and say, why am I doing this, right? But as long as I can blame the relationship, then I have this kind of narrative as to why I do these things. Right? So the unmet needs are the thing that's powering the addiction, okay? I'm not going to get into this part here for the sake of time. You can go back and look at this, right? But there's this, this cycle that's spinning faster and faster as I my needs continually go unmet. I try to meet them through sexual out, acting out behaviors. There's this shame crash, compounding distress, and again and again and again. I'm actually bypassing my real needs, sexualizing those needs where they're never going to get met through that sexual behavior because sexual behavior can't do those things. Sex can't do those things for me, right? So... It just spins faster and faster into an insane cycle where I do the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Okay. And again, it was stuff we know, know in the field that it's really not about sex, right? It's the sex is just the method of coping that arrives at the at the right time. Right. Okay. So what we need to do is so this is where we get to the intervention portion here. What we need to do then is what, what we're teaching people here to do is that we have to begin to parent ourselves again. We have to self-parent a little bit, okay? So um, and do I, how much time do I have, Tara, before the Q&A or am I already over time? Nope, you're good. Um, let's start Q&A no later than 12.50. That gives okay. us 10 minutes. Okay. Good. 
I had more time than I thought. All right, so what we got to do here is we got to go back into that frame, right? That hot and cold box frame. And we've got to kind of meet that woundedness in that moment, right? And what we call that there is self-parenting or re-parenting. And I think that's a, a, a kind of a popular phrase nowadays. And you're going to see it a lot on the internet. You know, I think Ken Adams actually has a little, some good stuff on, you know, around this that I wasn't aware of when, when we were thinking about this at the time. Um, I was a little bit late to the party um, there, but um, what, what we need to do first with these is to like get this kind of intellectual understanding first that, that I have these unmet attachment needs that are powering the addiction, right? That I'm going to these addictive behaviors to try to get attachment needs met in a way that's never going to meet them. Well, I first have to recognize that this is happening for me, that I'm stuck in these, these cotton coal box ways of encountering relationships. I'm seeking out these things. And what I really need to do in order to find real health, okay, is to figure out how to meet these needs with in my adult self that has resources, that has the, you know, um, the capacity with tools and help and therapy to figure these things out. So the second bullet point here is that I need to move to meet the needs. I need to recognize what they are and then move to meet them. In so this, this shows up, um, uh, I need therapy, right? I need, to, I need to join 12 step. I need to find some community and connection with people I need to seek out relational healing for my relationship. I need to, you know, seek a full therapeutic disclosure or whatever to begin that process of relational healing. Like I have to first intellectually assent to that reality, right? And then the second piece there is that I have to acknowledge that my perceptions of relationships and conflict have been distorted. And I have to develop some healthy distrust around my initial perceptions because of the trauma and that attachment wounding my initial response to these things is going to be most likely inaccurate i'm gonna gonna mistake the present for the past and i'm gonna get into this this kind of bind between the real and the perceived am i really in danger or am i perceiving that i'm in danger this is where we say, and you guys probably heard this phrase a lot, is, you know, first thought wrong. My first thought in relational conflict is normally going to be wrong, right? Oh, I'm under attack. Why are they stabbing me? Oh, I feel so cornered. I feel, you know, suffocated. I feel, you know, these are verbs that are masquerading as emotions, right? And and most likely that's not happening. They're They're reaching out. They're sharing their feelings. They're sharing anger or hurt or pain. I'm not actually under attack. I'm actually safe. This might remind me of something that was dangerous. And I'm perceiving it as something that's dangerous. But in reality, I'm very safe. Unless they have a knife or a gun. And then, you know, get out of there. Right? So we're, we're trying to teach these guys at first at the intellectual level that I have these unmet needs that are distorting both how I get those needs met or how I ought to get those needs met. And then, and then what is happening to me in my primary trigger, which is normally either my romantic relationship or like continued interaction with my family of origin. Okay. Like I can't tell you how many times I've worked with guys that are still working in the family business. And if you have um, a sex addict that you're working with and they're working with dad like they need a new job. Okay. We have to cr sometimes create the environment that's going to foster their healing. It's going to be really hard for them to find sobriety and you know, working in the family business, you know, still. So that second part of self-parenting is arguably the more important part is that we have to um, experientially move the needle here. We have to start caring for ourselves in an experiential way. As therapists, we have to provide a space in which they can experience um, what it's like to care for themselves and, and, and meet the moment, 
right? To have some sort of corrective or cathartic experience around that, that wounding and to experience that, not just uh, an idea, you know, but traveling that 18 inches from here to here, right? And, and the way that we do this, we're going to use trauma treatment to revisit and reprocess these traumas, right? Brain spotting is very effective for this in our program. Okay. We really I see a lot of great um, um, responses to brain spotting. EMDR works really well. If you're in kind of that long, longer term, like week to week therapy, like EMDR takes a little bit longer to set up. And so we like brain spotting because we can kind of get at it a little bit quicker that way. No shade on EMDR. I think it's great results. And it's, a lot of guys um, talk about those things. There's also other trauma treatments that are, that are kind of out there these days. And, and, the, you know, there's some, some results that are coming from those. I think IFS is a great intervention as a trauma treatment, guided meditation around IFS or inner child work. Like all of this is going to create environments for me to intervene and reprocess. Okay. And, and I really like guided meditation for these of, of, of kind of a reparenting moment to revisit a traumatized memory or a trauma, a trauma experience or an emblematic moment for them and engage with the wounded self to try to actually meet the need that was present in that moment. Okay. And an example of that, um, that has always stuck out to me as I was working with this um, guy in group and he was really struggling with this high activation in his nervous system, right? And he only, he felt compelled or, or pushed or, or, or carried along in his uh, nervous system to, in order to act out because it just felt so overwhelming for him. Right. And so he was, he was processing that with the group and just, and I could see that happening almost like the, the thermometer in a, in a, in a Looney Tunes, you know, just, right. In, in, in his activation. Right. And I asked him, you know, what, um, where did he first feel that moment? What was a, a memory that, that, that he could go back to? Like, I think that was maybe the first time that I could felt that energy building in my system. And he starts to describe how he was abused um, as a young person by the, the handyman, the family handyman, the neighborhood handyman. The handyman would come over to the house multiple times a year for years to fix things around the home. And he would, uh, you know, parents were, you know, out to lunch, right? They were not attentive. They were not supervising correctly, right? And so the, the, the handyman would find a way to lure this kid into the basement, whether he was working on the water heater or whatever. He would find an excuse or way to lure that boy into the basement, and he would sexually abuse him down there. And this happened multiple times a year for years, right? And so... What we did there is we helped him ground himself safely in that memory, the, the smells, the textures, the things that he could see and hear in that space, you know, we're regulating our breathing as we do that. And he's entering into that space, you know, in a, um, using his senses to do that and grounding himself in that memory a little bit. And, you know, I could smell the mustiness of the basement, the shag carpet, right? The, I can see the cement walls, right? And he's, he's, he's in that place, right? And, and he found that boy in that basement. And what do, what do you want to do for him? What does he need? Like, I, he needs to get out of there. He needs to be rescued. Okay, well, let's go and re what, what is he? What do you want to do? And he, and he picks him up. Right in his mind's eye, like a firefighter, right? Arms underneath his arms, like you arm underneath, you know, his his knees, and he's carrying him up out of the basement. And he's he's crying, he's weeping, and right, and like everyone's getting a little emotional. We're all coming around him to support him in this, right? And he brings him up out of the basement, rescuing him and brings him out into the he says, in, out into the light of the front yard and oh he's out in the front yard what do we what does he want to do? he just wants to play he just wants to be a boy he just wants to kick a ball he just wants to play he doesn't want to be in the basement he doesn't want to live in that place anymore he just doesn't want to, have to be burdened or to think about that experience right so he he just kicks a ball with him out there in the front yard and he comes up out of that and he's just weeping and and we're all you know i'm crying you know i was moved by this as, as well and and he says to me matt what do I do if he goes back into the basement? 
And I said the thing that you guys are all saying, right? Then we go back and get him. Right? We go back and get him until we don't have to anymore. All right? We're not going to abandon him down there anymore. And that's what happens in the trauma. We end up treating that wounded kid of a, that in that past hotbox and cold box like the abusers did. We're like, oh, we're going to ignore him and ignore his pain, or he's stupid, or he's weak, or he shouldn't have gone down there. He should have known better, right? And we end up treating him like the, those caregivers did instead of going back to that place, finding that, that young person and trying to meet the unmet need in that moment experientially. And I've seen incredible progress. I mean, very quickly, when we use this hot and cold box frame to fashion interventions that are designed to um, meet those unmet needs after you know and you know self-parenting is theory it's you know everybody at this point kind of understands the power of you know uh, corrective emotional experiences there right but we're targeting those around the unmet needs right and 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 helping guys understand what their core needs are that are, they're trying to get met in their sexual addiction, okay? And what, what happens here is that we get to move the client into not the hot box or the cold box, but a third box where we're getting to meet relationally with other people on, on equal footing, right? There's not a power differential. We're giving and receiving love and value. I'm becoming more present to myself, more responsive to myself. So, so I'm and then able to move into empathy, Right, and give away that presence and responsiveness to other people. If I can have empathy for myself and treat myself with compassion, then I can draw from that to meet with people that I've maybe hurt or people that I want to connect with. And they can say, you know, actually, you've made me feel like you felt as a kid. And if I have a connection to my own trauma, I can say, oh, I know what that feels like. Like you isolated me, you abandoned me, you, when you cheated on me, you left me. Right? Oh, I know what it's like to be left. Because I'm now in touch with that. And, right? So we see that softening where I can then disclose my worries and my fears. And I can, I can ask rather than demand, I can not out of entitlement, right? But out of a knowledge and a comfort with myself, seek to get my needs met and speak those either to other men in recovery and, or, or when my partner is feel safe and ready, I can, I can speak those to them. And this is a reciprocal, this creates a reciprocal relationship where we're giving and receiving love and value. You know, and it's way harder for trauma victims to receive than it is to give, right? Because of all the shame. Yeah. All right. So I moved through that stuff pretty quickly. Um, and there's a lot of information there. So, you know, I think we have some time for some questions. And so um, we'll kind of turn it over to Tara to, to moderate that. So thank you guys for your time. Yeah, thank you, Matt. I love this presentation, you guys. I've seen it several times. Um, I always get emotional when we talk about the basement story and um, it's always impactful. So thank you, Matt, for doing this. We have about 10 minutes, so we're just going to answer as many questions as possible. Anything we don't get to today, you guys, we will still answer those. I propose to Matt that we maybe do a follow-up Q&A, just him and I, and then we'll post that on our YouTube as well. So, uh, But we are going to end on time at 1 o'clock. All right. Marsha asks, uh, I'm trained in brain spotting. Curious, how do you do it in groups? I've heard about how effectively you do it from the clients I've sent to BAI. Oh, thanks, Marsha, for sending clients. Yeah, um, we don't actually do brain spotting in group. Uh, and I think there are some kind of um, interventions in, that are out there that David Grand has kind of put out there where, where you doing kind of even like, you know, brain spotting with a couple couples work or group brain spotting, things like we actually don't do that. We do the brain spotting in the individual work. So in the one on one sessions and then the guys come and can process their brain spotting sessions in the group. Sometimes what we do in group is some psychodrama, right? That kind of externalizes that internal process. So we'll use other members of the group to represent kind of the players in that memory or 
we'll just do a guided meditation in which everyone can participate in meeting, in, you know, in going back to that memory and, and, and trying to meet the needs of their inner child at that, at that point. Right. And um, we, I tell you guys, we're not doing time travel. We're just recognizing and validating the needs that we still have that are still present for us. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Thanks for that question. Does attachment trauma only happen in childhood or can an individual have no adverse childhood experiences, but the impact or the trauma happened in a romantic relationship in their adult years? Can they also develop attachment trauma in adulthood? Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I think it's a little bit more rare because my nervous system is actually developing as a young person, right? So it's more, um, there, it, there, that trauma can imprint in on my nervous system in a different way than a more mature nervous system. That trauma has to be really severe as an adult in order to, to change the way that my nervous system reacts in relationships, right? Let's say if I have a stable home, but I get betrayed as an adult, I can say, well, not all relationships are like that because I had this experience back here. So this hurts really bad, but I don't have that same wounding, right? Um, a little bit more resilient to it. But what a lot of people um, sometimes don't connect is that when there is that wounding as an adult, that severe trauma, um, I tend to sometimes focus on it, but there's there may be a rhyming trauma from when I was a young person where my system says, see, here we go again, right? And so guys will come in and say, actually, I was wounded because my college girlfriend cheated on me and that's really what set this all off. But we'll look and we say, okay, we'll validate that. But we find out later, like there's this, there's this abandonment that happened as a young person. And those kind of, kind of rhymed. And my system said, oh no, not again, right? And so it made the betrayal in college feels a lot bigger and more impactful. But it was that original abandonment that kind of um, set the system off, if that, if that makes any sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, Tim would love for you to speak to the relationship between attachment trauma and sexual anorexia. Yeah, I get that question a lot. And in, 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 um, it's a complex answer there because the way I understand sexual anorexia is um, because of the trauma or because of how I'm encountering kind of a, a kind of a, a dysfunctional view of my own recovery, like sex is bad, right? And so I don't want to do the bad thing. And I don't want to do the bad thing with the partner who I care about. I don't want to soil that. This is all kind of subconscious, right? Um, so I think it has more to do with the actual trauma that was experienced and how shame shows up in my life than it made to do with the attachment trauma itself and i know that's probably not a satisfying answer and i bet there are people out there that would maybe give you a better one but um uh that's the the, the best i can do i'm sure there is some connection between the attachment wounding and sexual anorexia i'm, I'm sure there i i haven't been able to kind of put that together in my own mind and so i would encourage you to hold that question and um uh continue to try to seek the answer there because I, I'm not quite sure how to answer that, but I'm, I'm sure there is, and I'm, I'm sure it's going to come up in the chat. Even that people have some really great ideas about how those things connect. Um, but in the moment right now, I'm not. Yeah. You know, There's a lot of great commentary from our, our um, attendees today. So um, this is a great question from Eddie. Uh, and I like it because it talks about betrayal trauma. So what happens if the addict overcomes the hot cold box complex? However, the betrayed partner cannot heal from the trauma. What do you see as next steps for that couple? Can you say that again? I'm sorry. Yeah. What happens if the addict manages to overcome the hot cold box complex that you talked about, but the betrayed partner can't heal from the trauma? That they've experienced so the betrayal trauma what do you see as next steps for that couple yeah i'm so you know for those that aren't familiar with um you know relational healing and sex addiction it happens at kind of two different trajectories right so the addicts uh recovery is a little bit steeper because they're getting a lot of treatment they're getting a lot of attention um they're getting some help they're also in the know 
right? So they already knew all the things that they were doing. And so they, they don't have to play catch up because they were there the whole time, right? So the partner trajectory is, is a little flatter because they're still trying to figure out what's happened to them and, and their reality. So um, there's, they're also dealing with all the emotions of, of being exposed to that information and, and, and the wounding of that, right. And the dysregulation around that. And maybe the addict is not done lying or acting out. So they're, they're, there's all sorts of new traumas that are happening right in real time for them. So, so think about it like this. So the addicts getting better a little bit quicker, right. And, and they're coming to resolve some of these things, but the partner's going to take more time just because they haven't had the time or the help. And they oftentimes don't get the therapeutic attention that the addict does because the crisis seems to be with the addicts. Right. So, but eventually these lines ideally are going to uh, converge at some point down the road and we have to just be patient and it's actually really good for addicts to do that because when I, I'm giving time and compassion to, to this, to my partner as they work through this, right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to cut their arm off right in my sexual behavior and then walk away because I don't want to get blood on my shoes. Right. I, I, I'm going to be present to that. I've had 20, 30 years of my addiction and now I'm going to give some time to this relational healing. I'm not going to walk away because she's not getting it or he's not getting it quick enough. But what we do need to do is find some sobriety, um, find some consistency, move into recovery, which is defined by empathy and presence and transparency and vulnerability. And then as I get, create some safety in those relational choices, I can move into a uh, couple's work, right? Um, Carol Sheets has some great work around early recovery couples work, right? Where, where I'm, I'm validating, I'm acknowledging and validating and reassuring. I'm meeting those triggers with emotional presence. And what I'm doing as I do that is I'm honoring that little boy. I'm honoring that traumatized young person because I'm giving, I'm giving away what I needed, right? So that's kind of the broad, broad strokes there, but that's kind of the direction that we want to head in the coupleship, you know? Yeah. I think we have time for one more, which is a shame because we have so, so many great ones in here. Like I said, we will, we will answer these later. Um, Can I say, but, one thing? Yeah. I, I want to say one thing? There, there's actually someone in this training that has really good information on this. So Eddie Caparucci, I know that he could answer that earlier question better than I could about the connection between attachment wounding and um, sexual anorexia. So I would encourage you guys to kind of seek out Eddie's stuff in some of his books because uh, I'm just not able to recall it, but I, but I can, I know for sure that he would be able to answer that question better. Yeah, that's great. Um, let's just end on uh, what is the overall long-term success rate of treatment for this, for sex addiction and developing healthy attachments? One more time. What is the overall long-term success rate of treatment for sex addiction? and uh developing healthy attachments um i think if, if if everything lines up right in the way that we want it we, we have the gift of desperation we have the right therapeutic help we have a recovery plan we have uh, a, a strong program right that's going to take the baton from serious treatment into the kind of a weekly uh, recovery program that's very robust, you know, multiple meetings a week, group therapy, individual therapy, couples work, right? If we set up the conveyor belt in just the right way, like success is very possible, but I don't give it a percentage because there's so many variables there. But if I take it seriously and I have that, I'm gift of desperation. What I mean is like, I will do anything. I'm willing to do anything to get better then your chances of getting on that therapeutic conveyor belt and following that to the end and getting better is really, really high. Um, and it's going to be hard. It's going to kind of mark the rest of your life, but it can move you in a, a, into health in a way that can sometimes be deeper than people that haven't had addiction recovery that aren't really paying attention to their inner world and to the inner world of other people around them. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't calculate success from our program in terms of people that don't act out anymore 
what we actually do is we assess relational capital. Have I grown in my ability to be trustworthy? Have I grown in my ability to be a safe person? Have I grown in my ability to empathize? Right. And, and that's how we establish success and what you do with it. Right. Is really in the hands of the person in recovery after that. But when they fall, let me say this, when they follow the advice of, of BAI and BAI generally aligns with the field, very likely that they'll get better. It's just, you know, it's a tough yeah. road to hope. Yeah. I think our, our quite robust alumni program, I think speaks to the success of this kind of work. So it works. Yeah. Um, and we love those guys that come through our program. So um, with that, you guys, uh, we will send you an email with a link to our follow-up q and I hope, Matt, I'm not speaking out of turn by saying that you'll do that with me. Um, and then just a quick reminder, once I close out this webinar or once you leave, make sure you fill out your evaluation. I can't give you a certificate of completion until you fill that out. It's just them's the rules. That's how they want us to do it. So um, and if you happen to miss that or can't find the link, we'll also send it via email. But I think that's what we've got today. Thank you all for being here and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks guys. Bye, Matt.